Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Detola, and I'd like to welcome you to this webinar entitled The Three-Day Crown Revolution. Now, why is it a revolution? Well, I got the name of the webinar, so I liked it. I liked the sound of it. No, it, but it's a revolution because we've been seeding crowns in two weeks ever since I got out of dental school. And dental school was three, three and a half weeks. And then I got out, bought a practice, and um, it had been two weeks, and it was always two weeks. And this is a very common standard. And so it is a revolution if we're going to talk about seeding crowns um, after three days, or at least have a three-day in-lab process, and then seed our crowns because it's a revolution because it's no one's really ready. Very few people, I should say, are ready to do it right now. And by people, I mean laboratories, but to a certain extent, dentists too. We're not used to scheduling like that. We have to learn to trust uh, the process. Obviously, we have to be able to track the case through lab, and we have to do several other things to be able to do this. But I hope to explain to you today the advantages of why this is going to fundamentally change your practice, especially in terms of how long you're taking to seat crowns and how much you have to adjust and how many are, are remade or adjusted or sent back to the lab or the anatomy is obliterated to try to get the crown to fit. So as we get started, let's start in the laboratory with the digitization of laboratories. Labs for the first time in history have jumped ahead of dentists in terms of technology. We've always kind of led them and dragged the labs into technology by requesting new materials. You know, Empress, Emacs are good examples where a manufacturer starts coming out with the material, the lab doesn't do it yet, and it's in response to the dentist asking for it that the labs start doing it for the most part. Unless it's a big lab that does a ton of advertising, then they'll do it on their own and invest the money and the equipment and the process and the employees to get it done and then start advertising it to dentists. But for most of the smaller labs we're going to use, they're not going to do this until dentists start to ask them to do this. And then somewhat reluctantly, maybe they'll be pulled into actually doing that. So that is part of the thing. One of the things that we need to be attentive to do is to make requests to our laboratories of what we want them to do rather than expecting them to read our minds or do what should be done what's in the patient's best interest or the tooth's best interest, because I don't know if they know, for one thing. And second of all, it's gonna represent probably a pain point for them because there's gonna be some change involved. Same is true for us as well, but as more dentists start to inter adopt intraoral scanners, we get closer to this becoming a reality. But laboratories have jumped right past us and now 99% of dental laboratories are digitized. So if we look at something, so look at an analog versus a digital example, we can look at a conventional dye spacer. You remember in dental school, a little bottle looked like fingernail polish, shake it up, paint it on there. And as you can see, um, it wasn't very uniform. You could have 300 microns on the top where it would pool into an area where you had a concavity. You could have 50 microns on the mesial and 20 microns on the distal. And so it led to fits that weren't as good as they could be. If there was any ditched out areas, the dye spacer would pool there as well. And you look at today with a digital dye spacer that is 90 microns thick everywhere. And this is one of the reasons why dentists have noticed over the last 10 years that crowns have started to fit better. Part of that is because of the milled materials that we're using. And part of it's because of the standardization and the uniformity of the dye spacers now. Dye spacer used to be, you know, thicker if a technician left the lid off and let the acetone evaporate from it. Um, those who covered it, it would stay a little bit thinner, but it was unpredictable where it would go and it's not nearly as precise as it is digitally today. So that's part of the advantage that we have. Again, with this 90 microns, that's going to be on the majority of the crown, but you can see it tapering out um, as you work down and that goes down to 30 microns at the margin. So just keep in mind that Every crown is designed with a slightly open margin, 30 microns. It has to, or the crown wouldn't seat. We need somewhere for the excess cement uh, to leave the crown as the patient bites down on the crown or else it's just gonna rebound and, and never go down. In the old days, dentists used to have holes in the occlusal surface of a crown. So think about this. If you wanna design a crown where the margins are completely closed, you'd have to have an escape vent in the top of the crown for the excess cement to come out then you could actually design margins that were closed. Now, whether or not they'd fit would depend on the accuracy of your impression and the model. If there was a model poured up, if you took a conventional impression or the margin marking uh, by the laboratory or how easy your margin was to read. And so this 30 microns is, 
is probably a nice little space to be able to play with. But you could design a crown where the margins were closed. The cement would escape through the top of the crown and then you would get the clean out the excess cement and place a little composite there. Um, does a patient want a crown with a hole in the top filled with composite? No, but does a patient want a crown with open margins when that's the area where if the tooth ends up needing endo, it's gonna be from recurrent decay around the margin. Do they want that either? Um, so I don't know, I just bring it up because it's something you can consider if you wanted to try vented crowns. Uh, with your laboratory. Uh, but for now, 90 microns of die spacer and most labs are going with 30 microns at the margin. For the parameters, most of the labs are using some sort of um, occlusion tape or a silk-like typewriter ribbon, if you remember Madame Butterfly, for example. And the interesting point is that they never used dental floss to check the contacts of a crown in the lab. It was one of the striking things to me is that that's the only way we really check contacts and to make sure they're solid enough in the mouth or too tight if the floss breaks. That's all we use is dental floss. We might use some marking medium if we want to identify where the contact is, but otherwise we're using floss. No dental labs use floss to check contact. So it's interesting that we don't even use the same methodology for checking whether or not they are tight. Now, because of the digitization and the digital design of these crowns, they're now designed with the contacts, the mesial and distal contact, each open 10 microns. And when you look at the thickness of commercially available dental flosses, they range anywhere from about 45 microns to about 70 microns. So even if you do design um, a proximal contact open 10 microns, the floss is still going to snap as it goes through. And this gives you a little bit of wiggle room. And this is going to keep us from shoving those two teeth in opposite directions. Um, we tend to think is we, we want these touched together and pushed really tight, but we actually want some physiological relief between the restoration we're putting in and the adjacent teeth. Teeth move throughout the days. Contacts, you know, start off very tight in the morning and get looser um, by the afternoon as we use our teeth more. There's studies that show how much floss it takes or how many, how many pounds of pressure it takes to get floss in between the teeth. And on a given patient, it changes throughout the day. So thankfully, we're no longer scraping models um, with a with a knife after putting some red pencil on it that's pretty inexact. Now we can exactly design crowns, uh, 10 microns open in the mesial and the distal. The materials we're using today have minimum material thicknesses. There should be a sticker anytime uh, on a box on a, from your lab, anytime you get close to one of these thicknesses. So yes, for example, with solid zirconia, full strength, 3Y, 100% tetragonal zirconia, class five zirconia, there's five different ways to refer to the same material that I said right there, but it's all the original high strength materials like Bruxer, and they can be milled as thin as six tenths of a millimeter, as you see by the orange outline here, but do not expect it to look like a crown. Expect it to look like a tooth colored thimble because you can't have a lot of anatomy. You can see you need to have more space and more reduction if you wanna have true anatomy. So. There are minimums that the software will not let um, the people who design the crowns go through, and that's part of the reason we're gonna use a prep technique based on depth cutters to make sure that we give them enough room to give us restorations that are not only gonna last a decent amount of time, whatever that is to you, 10 to 20 years, but they're also gonna look good and the patient's gonna like how it looks, and we're gonna like how it looks as well. Ponic adaptation has gotten much easier now. All the ponics that are designed are designed to go a penetrate three tenths of a millimeter into the tissue. Obviously it doesn't actually penetrate in the real world. It just causes some pressure and make sure that it's in good contact, but it's not too much pressure to keep a bridge from seeding. And so again, instead of scraping edentulous ridges where we marked it with a red pencil and then scrape it with a Bart Parker, we now have a much more precise way for our technicians to give us ponics that are gonna compress the tissue and all edentulous ridges will compress three tenths of a millimeter. Some will blanch more than others, but it will not keep a multi-unit restoration from seeding on the abutments, which is great. But here's the one that kind of leads us to the three-day crowns. This is the thing, the occlusal parameter or the occlusal offset, whatever you want to call it here. And this is what labs do in order to try to make their, especially if they're working a bigger laboratory with a lot of dentists, to try to make them, you know, or give them an experience where they're not complaining about having to adjust the occlusion too much. And so laboratories will often, and even CEREC users, you know, do this and do it routinely with Emacs, will design their crowns out of occlusion. 
you know, it's kind of standard in the Serret world. If you're milling uh, lithium disilicate, to design them 150 microns um, out of occlusion, you know, just so you don't have to do so much adjusting once you get there. And part of it's the flexure of the burrs um, while they're actually milling and whether or not uh, the diamonds are cutting at maximum efficiency. But a lot of labs have gone to 400 microns, which is four tenths of a millimeter or somewhere around there. It could be 200 or 300. But the point is that we're leaving these crowns are being made whenever possible slightly out of occlusion because the number one complaint that dentists have to any laboratory that you call in the U.S. and I'm sure worldwide is having to adjust the occlusion too much. Number two is having to adjust the contacts too much. You know, don't fit and things like that fall farther down on the list. It's having to sit in front of the patient and just grind, 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 grind and have a, and, and taking anatomy that probably looked good before and inadvertently destroying it uh, while trying to get this crown to fit in the mouth. So our goal is crowns that drop in from an inch above the tooth, not literally, but you know what I mean, they very easily go in and rarely, 85% of the time, do not have to have the bite touched at all. That should be our goal and that should be what our labs are able to deliver to us if in fact we are giving them good preps, easy to read margins, and uh, good impressions that pick all that up. So what's going on here? You know, we, I noticed when I spent my 15 years in the lab that we would have dentists who would continually complain about the occlusion on their crowns being high. And so I would go and flag the account. We would check these cases as they were going out the door. And we could check and see on the articulated model that the crowns were in fact right on as they left the door. And then the doctor would get that crown, try it in, have to adjust it and be upset at the amount of adjustment that was necessary. And of course, the only thing that can cause that is the temporary crown. You know, even in the CEREC world, they were doing some occlusal compensation and they didn't even have a temporary. So the temporary crown is the source of much agitation and aggravation for dentists and laboratories alike because the lab is holding up their end of the deal. The crown is leaving the lab with the proper occlusion on the articulated models. And then the dentist is justifiably frustrated when they have to go in and do a ton of adjusting on that crown itself. And the only finger not being pointed here is the one at the temporary crown who happens to be the guilty party. Um, it, definitely the guilty party. It is the explanation. And when dentists start paying attention to it, they begin to notice it. But it's, it's not even really temporary crowns per se. Is if you left the temporary crown in for three days, for example, you don't get much influence on the way the final crown fits. It's the two week temporary crown that causes this dilemma. It's putting in a temporary crown in the mouth and leaving it there for two weeks. Our well-meaning dental assistants are trying to make the temporary as smooth as possible uh, for our patients so that there's no sharp edges for their tongue. And bisacryl material is very easy to over polish. It's very easy to overpolish the occlusal surface of a bisacryl temporary crown and inadvertently take it 200, 300, 400 microns out of occlusion. During that two week period, the tooth, that prep will definitely super erupt. And then when the crown comes from the lab, it'll fit perfectly on the articulated model and be very high when the patient bites down on it in their mouth. And the guilty party is the temporary crown. So if you want to check this, um, next week or this week, whenever you happen to be watching this webinar, just before your uh, dental assistant dismisses your crown of bridge patients, especially like just random single unit crowns, just posterior single unit crowns, because that's really what we're talking about when we talk about three day crowns. Before the patient gets dismissed, just go in with a piece of Acufilm 2, 16 microns thick, have the patient bite down and see if there's a centric stop on the temporary crown. Um, we just need a spot there. It doesn't necessarily even have to be as big of a spot as on the adjacent natural teeth. Um, it's fine if it's not, but we have to have a centric stop in the right place on the tooth and it just, it has to be there and I'm not, and it has to be there with a single piece of Acufilm for that tooth not to super erupt during the two weeks that the crown is in place. So just check. This was a source of my frustration. I was practicing inside the laboratory. And Cindy, my technician, you know, was 100 yards away and bringing me crowns. And when we originally were seeing them two weeks afterwards, I was still having to adjust. And meanwhile, there's a whole team of people trying to give me the best crowns possible with the least amount 
of adjustment. So my assistant was unwittingly, you know, over polishing the crowns. And so this is something that it's kind of a return to basics or fundamentals is really all you're trying to do when you're checking up on your dental assistant's temporary crowns. This isn't something we're going to check. And if there's not an occlusal stop, he or she is fired. That's not what this is about. This is about like going over the basics again and making sure that this is happening. But even then, you know, when we put a temporary crown in their mouth, there's like six different things that can happen during those two weeks and, and none of them are good. There just aren't any good ones. It's all, you know, bad stuff. I mean, why, why are we waiting two weeks? I can't find any clinical research. I can't find any uh, publications. I can't find anything that shows a study why we should be waiting two weeks. I think it was just decided back in the late 1950s when the PFM was invented. Before that, a lot of dental offices had in-office technicians making gold restorations for them, which were simple and straightforward. All of a sudden you have the PFM, a lot more involved, big ceramic furnaces are necessary, and uh, becomes a multi-day, multi-week procedure. So maybe back in 1959, when the first one was getting ready to be done, the dentist said, when should I reappoint the patient? How long is it gonna take? And the lab tech who made the first PFM was like, uh, pff, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't be, can we go to the lake for a couple of days or a softball tournament? Uh, uh, two weeks? Then it's like, sure, that's fine. And then ch -ch -ch, it's etched in stone in granite for the next 50 years because of that original two weeks. And uh, it does not have to be like that. You know, no adjustment crown seat appointments is what we are looking for here. This is the goal. This is such a beautiful place, you know, to be. We're going to talk about the prep and the impression uh, later on today. Uh, but that second appointment to be able to drop that in uh, and to not have to anesthetize. You know, I'm using two coats of Gluma or a Gluma substitute, as Rella Christensen points out, for one minute each, not only to kill 99.9% .9 of the bacteria on the teeth, but to cause great desensitization of that tooth. And when you have a three-day crown, you can just wiggle that crown off. You don't need to anesthetize. The tooth is still desensitized from those two coats of Gluma three days before. So we're looking for no adjustment crown seat appointments as the rule, not the exception. So I'm going to have to share something with you that your lab doesn't want you to know, and you can probably guess what this is already. It does not take two weeks to make a crown. It just doesn't. Sarek wouldn't exist uh, if it took two weeks to make a crown. You know it doesn't take two weeks. It's closer to two hours. Now, obviously, the lab's got multiple clients and, and a lot of work to do. Uh, but two weeks, have you ever noticed when sometimes you send a case into your lab and let's say it's uh, it's been out for two weeks and it's we're supposed to seed it on Wednesday, for example. And on Monday, the lab calls and says, oh, hey, we didn't get a shade or, oh, hey, that is, the impression looks a little distorted or whatever they might call for. It looks a little under reduced. And you're like, why are they calling on a Monday two days before this? They've had it for two weeks. Do you know why? Because they just started the case then. Because it doesn't take them two weeks to make it. It's just their workflow or the number of employees they have. They just are starting the case now. So they get them in and they slowly move, you know, through this python. Like it's eaten another mammal and it's going down and slowly moving through this process. It does not take that long. It takes a what? A day to make an Emax crown? Is there solid zirconia is an overnight process because of the seven, eight, nine hour center time in the oven? So two days? That's how long it takes to make crowns. You know, whether or not the lab wants to take two weeks is 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 totally up to them. But it has nothing to do with the manufacturer of the crown material itself. It's just what they're used to doing. It's just what their whole way of doing things is based around. Um, but it's a habit. It's not based on what's best for the patient, what's best for the tooth, what's best for our office. Or, and maybe it is based on what's base, best for them. It's just the way they're set up right now. Uh, and so it's the easiest thing to do and it's hard to change. So no adjustment crown seat appointments got to be the rule, not the exception. And the secret to those are is three-day crowns, shortening the time between we, when we prep and when we seat. So the best scenario here would be same-day crowns. Prep the crown, digital scan, design it, mill it in your office, and 90 minutes, two hours later, boom, it's ready to go in the patient's mouth. But that requires a significant investment in technology. And even more difficult than that is just the change and all the education that you and your staff need to be able to do this. And then changing the way you schedule based on that, you might not 
like what feels like downtime to you. And a lot of dentists just frankly say, I'd, I'd like to prep a crown or two crowns, whatever, take an impression, and then just go to the next room, prep another one and, and have my lab do it. I'm fine with having my lab do it. I don't necessarily want to be a laboratory technician and, and that's fine. So when you're, when it comes to like seating crowns with no adjustments and what's the best thing for the tooth, you know, the best thing is seating the crown the same day. We're not going to, we're really not going to argue that. And I think 20 years from now, 30 years, 10 years, who knows, we'll all be doing that for single unit posterior teeth. What's probably not the best idea is to put a piece of plastic on that tooth, um, especially for two weeks with a cement that's designed to fail, a temporary cement so that when we go wiggle it, it's just going to come off two weeks later. And it's not going to have the greatest margins. We're just going to you know, trim it pretty quickly because it doesn't need the best margins because it's only going to be in for two weeks. I'm pretty sure that's not the best thing for the tooth. You know, we never take out an old amalgam, put a temporary in, send the patient home, and then two weeks later, take the temporary out and put the direct composite in. You can't argue that it would really do anything good for the tooth and the final result. So same day is the best. Same, well, same day with a technician still making your crown, if you have an in-office technician, that's kind of the best of both worlds. And that's what I got to do when I was practicing in the lab. I would prep the tooth, I would scan it, Cindy would design it, mill it, stain and glaze it, because we were staining and glazing at the time, bring me the crown, and two hours later it's in the patient's mouth. Same day crown with all the artistry from a CDT uh, doing your crown. That's kind of the best of both worlds. And I, I doubt any dentist would turn down the opportunity to, to do that because now your staff is still, you and your staff are still doing exactly what you're doing. There's just another employee, a laboratory technician in your office milling all the crowns, digitally printing the night guards or whatever. So, I mean, that doesn't change your workflow at all with the exception of doing digital impressions if you're not currently doing that. But, you know, so we don't want two weeks, same day is difficult to achieve. And what we found, Cindy and I in the lab was that three days worked really well. Uh, it worked better than six or seven days. Two days didn't seem to make any difference. Um, so it's, it became three days and it's a, it's a manageable workflow. Once you kind of adopt your thinking to, we're going to prep this crown and it's going to be in the lab three days and then back in our office the next day. And then we can seed it. You know, when I was practicing inside the lab, we were seeding crowns on the third day, but that's not really practical because you, you got to have it shipped from wherever your lab is, but that's what we're shooting for. And so I've mentioned Cindy and Keevan who were both at the lab and we both spent 15 years working together there. And then since started a lab of their own called 38 smiles, a digital dental. And uh, they are basically the people, they, they got the web address, 3daycrowns.com, and this has become what they are known for. This was something we developed while we were working in the lab together, mainly because I was frustrated at how much adjustment I was having to do on these crowns that were beautiful. And I was like, why? <laughs> I've got, you know, 800 technicians here in the building. Why am I having to adjust these crowns? And it was, again, because of the, the temporaries, but even properly um, adjusted temporaries where you've got that occlusal centric stop on the temporary crown. Bisacro material is soft and during two weeks some people who brux or who clench can wear through that and you can still lose some vertical dimension and have to adjust the crown. And I'm serious about not wanting to have to touch those crowns and then repolish them. And it looks insanely impressive in front of the patients too. So 3daycrowns.com. And we're not talking about all crowns here. We're talking about certain crowns, single unit posterior crowns, as you'll see. So we're not saying, you know, if you have an anterior crown, if you're doing translucent zirconia or Emax on tooth number nine, uh, that's not really a, a, a three-day crown. Yes, it's a single unit, but it's an anterior and, and uh, it's going to take more time and we want the lab to take more time. It might be ready in three days. It just depends on how much information you give them. If you'd like a single unit back in three days, you better take a good picture of the tooth before you prep it and the one next to it, and it should be in focus. You can do this with an iPhone 13 and get a fantastic picture. You're gonna want a picture of the patient smiling, one with retractors in, and then a shade tab in place with the incisal edge of the shade tab touching the incisal edge of the tooth. Um, that takes a lot of the guesswork out for the technician and you've given them a target to actually aim at. But really what we're talking about is posterior single unit crowns here, not multiple veneers, not bridges, not bigger cases, just those posterior single units um, are the ones where this concept really works well. And if you look at um, 
These numbers happen to be from Glidewell when I was there. 75% of the cases coming in were single units and then another 11% uh, were two units. So it's pretty clear that at least in the largest lab in the country that um, Crown and Bridge gets done one and two units at a time. And most of the time, 75% of the time, it's a single unit. And 80% of those, 80 to 85% of those are posterior crowns. And so 80% of that, 80 to 85% of that, 75%, these are all candidates for three-day crowns. The single unit posterior crown, which makes up a lot, as you can see, of what American dentists do. So there are a lot of teeth that are perfect candidates for three-day crowns. A digital scanner is necessary. You really can't, you know, take, a, if you take a polyvinyl impression, polyvinyl and polyether work great. They really do. They, they, don't get me wrong. I mean, they, they work fabulously well. All the great dentistry done by Gordon Christensen, Frank Spear, Bill Strupp, all done with polyvinyl and polyether. So it's a remarkably accurate material that works well, but you have to take the impression, then you have to ship it to your lab. Then they have to pour it up, then they have to pin it, um, cut out the dye, do all that stuff, and then put it in the scanner because they all design in the digital environment. So that's adding just tons of time to what it takes, as opposed to finishing a prep, scanning it, and three minutes later it pops up on the monitor in your laboratory and they can start designing it right then. That's why a digital scanner is necessary for three-day crowns because it just saves you the time of you know having to send it to the dental laboratory and all their time of them getting it being able to be used so here's our list of demands i i i, I wanted to call it a list of requests but i don't think that's strong enough because the lab industry is being very slow to act and i've been talking about this since i was in the lab practicing in the lab and other labs would come to visit and they're like oh that sounds great but i don't know if we can pull that up here's our demands Three day crowns for posterior single unit crowns. So that can be three days in the laboratory. We'll, we'll start them there. Even though it takes a day to make Emacs and it takes two days to make zirconia. Okay, we'll give them three days. Yeah, you got a bonus day lab. Three days in lab and then ship it back overnight to us. You're gonna get it from us with a digital scanner. Polish my zirconia crowns, don't glaze them. Rella Christensen was the first one to start talking about this uh, nine years ago. And uh, she's absolutely right, and it makes a huge uh, difference uh, in the wear rates of the opposing teeth if we're not putting glaze on the teeth and just polishing zirconia. Most of us are old enough that we grew up in an era where the PFM was the workhorse in dentistry and the feldspathic porcelains would chew teeth up so much that you had to put glaze on as a protective coating that hopefully would last a good long while. Once that glaze was gone, those PFMs were going to start eating into the opposing teeth, especially lower anterior teeth. And so we've always had this glaze, and it's the same glaze today that you can put on zirconia or lithium disilicate, but now the glaze actually causes more wear than the materials underneath it, than the polished zirconia, the zirconia oxide, or the lithium disilicate. So it was a coat of protection before, because even though the glaze wore the opposing tooth, it wore it so much less than the feldspath like PFM porcelain underneath there. Now it's the exact opposite. The glaze continues to wear the opposing teeth, and then once the patient wears through it and gets to the zirconia oxide or the lithium disilicate, the wear stops. So don't glaze them, just polish them. Why won't most laboratories polish your zirconia crowns? Because it takes uh, minutes instead of seconds to do it. So glaze is responsible for all the initial wear on opposing teeth. Um, you can see two pictures, these are Rella's uh, SEMs and you can see how the glaze wears away so that's that initial seat on the left and on the right you can see the glaze starting to break down and the patient chewing through in those spots and getting down to the smoother material now where the opposing teeth won't wear anymore um, polished zirconia receives more wear than it causes to opposing teeth I'm gonna say that again because that's counterintuitive when you polish zirconia oxide it gets so smooth that it receives more wear from enamel on the opposing tooth than it causes to the enamel on the opposing tooth. And here's Rella saying it, so you don't have to believe me. This is back in 2014. So she was saying this eight years ago. And um, she actually put it in red <laughs> because it was so counterintuitive. You can see right above the graph, Bruxer received more wear than it caused. And you can look at those numbers or go back to the June 2014. You can just believe her um, that it does. And that's why polished zirconia is great. But to to glaze zirconia, it takes about 15 seconds to spray the glaze on, then you stick it in the oven and keep working on something else. To polish zirconium, get down in the 
And the easier thing to polish are the proximal surfaces and the axial surfaces. The hard parts, the, the occlusal surface, and that takes minutes, not seconds. And that's why most uh, laboratories don't do it unless you ask for it. Whereas with uh, 38 Smiles a Digital Dental, that's your default mode. They will not glaze their cornea unless you ask them to do it. What does it look like to, when it's polished zirconia versus glaze? Well, here's an uh, A2 Bruxer crown on the left and one on the right. One is glazed and one is polished. You can probably tell which one's which because the one on the right probably looks more familiar because glaze kind of pools up a little bit in the deeper pits. And you can see that we have that glaze in those pits on the, on the crown over on the right. Um, the polished crown doesn't have that same look until it gets wet. Once it has the patient's saliva on it, now it looks like the glazed crown on the right. And so out of the mouth, it does have a different look. But as soon as it's in the mouth and wet, or as soon as you squirt water on it, it looks the same as the glazed crown does. And so don't fixate on what it looks like out of the box. Um, we just need to know that when, when it's wet, when it has saliva on it, it's gonna look the same as the glazed crown. And that's where it's always going to be, is in the patient's mouth once it's cemented or adhesively bonded into place, there's no reason to judge it um, out of the box when it's dry, or you can always put some water on it if you wanna do that, uh, just to see it as well. But know that you're not causing any wear of the opposing tooth. You're causing less wear than with glaze on it. And again, polish zirconia around the gingival margin. Uh, biofilm has a harder time adhering to that, even than a harder time than even with cast gold, the patron saint of dental restoration. So. Polished zirconia um, can do some amazing things for us, especially if we don't glaze it. So PPE, we're all very familiar, unfortunately, uh, with this acronym now, uh, but I, I want it to stand for Polishing Protects Enamel. And so next time you think of PPE, try to remind yourself, why, why are we still having the, lays, uh, the lab glaze our zirconia crowns? In fact, you don't have to put glaze on the lithium disilicate crowns either if you don't want to. And since it's all about wear, um, on anterior crowns, Cindy and the 38 Smiles crew, they glaze the facial surface of anterior crowns and they polish the lingual surface. So the polished lingual surface of the crown is in contact with the lower anterior tooth, but the facial surface of the crown is glazed because why not? It looks good and we're not gonna have any wear there. So it just makes sense. It's common sense to glaze the facial and not the enamel. So again, bacterial biofilm difficulty colonizing polished zirconia. So our list of demands is growing. Three-day crowns for posterior single units. Polish my crowns, don't glaze them. Glaze the facial of my anterior crowns, polish the lingual. Stain and color my zirconia crowns in the green state, just this means when it comes out of the mill and it's still, it's not green, it's white in its oversized method. Um, do it then to give true color um, to these crowns. If you remember old PFMs, once the glaze wore off because of acidic drinks or whatever, and it took a while, usually 15, 20 years, but when the stain came off as well, all of a sudden you'd have these dead white, opaque looking PFM crowns. Um, so what we wanna do here is make sure that our crowns are being stained and glazed in the green state. So that if you do have to make an occlusal adjustment, you know, it doesn't turn white underneath it. It's still the same color all the way through. And you can see here on this picture at the bottom, oops, you can see here on this picture at the bottom, um, that we've got zirconia crowns on the molars and lithium disilicate everywhere else. And they actually do pretty well next to each other aesthetically. Now, granted, this is lower teeth and, and not upper teeth, but you get that same kind of look when you're not just surface staining zirconia. Um, and, and it gives it more a little bit more of a visual depth, even though the Emax, the lithium disilicate is way more translucent uh, in this case. All right, so three-day crowns dental lab. Um, that's, they also go by 38 smiles. So they, they kind of use both names, but, uh, I urge them to use the three day, um, crowns name to get three day crowns.com because this is my mission in life for the rest of my career is to change the lab industry to this. I have seen the results from doing this. This is what we need to be doing. It's the right thing to do. I want this to be my legacy is, is being, I don't want to be known for it necessarily. I just want to be, I mean, just because I don't really care about it, but I, I do want to be a force to get to shrink the time between prep and see just because it's the right thing to do. And when you see how much easier it's going to make your life and your patient's life, your whole dental team's life, you're going to absolutely love it. And so maybe one day you say, thanks, Mike, 
Thank you for doing all these endless webinars about three-day crowds um, and why we should be doing them and helping to force the laboratory industry. But it's not just me. You've got to be the one who asks your lab for it too. Um, so do this. Try out, you know, 38 Smiles Digital Dental. Try a couple three-day crowns with them. See the difference. See that it works. Then you can call your lab and have this conversation that I've tried it. I've seen it. I like it. I didn't have to do any adjustments. The patient only had to be in a you know, plastic temporary crown for you know, four days instead of 14 days or 18 days or whatever it ends up being. And at least then you can speak from a position of authority to tell your lab and say, hey, I've done it. I've experienced it. It works. I want this. And then they can decide whether or not uh, you're a big enough account to influence what they do. But when you get the opportunity to do this and see what it's like, especially when you don't have to anesthetize patients because those two coats of Gluma have kept that tooth desensitized. It just makes those appointments so much shorter, so much easier. And most of the time, it's just my assistant hanging her head out going, we're ready. I haven't even been in the room yet to see the crown. It drops in. The contacts are good. The occlusion's good. She's like, we're ready. And by we're ready, we're ready to cement the crown. I, at this point, I don't even need to see it in the mouth anymore because I know that it looks good and it's gonna, and it fits the way it's supposed to. And we can just cement it into place. So we're talking real, I mean, she's checked the contacts and the occlusions, of course, but it streamlines things so much more. All right, so pre center coloring in the green state. Again, 38 smiles. All the anterior crowns are glazed on the facial polished on the lingual. Even if you don't know to ask for it, they're going to do it because it's the right thing to do for your patient and their teeth. They accept files from all digital scanners, so they're agnostic in, uh, in that way. Um, I have a couple digital scanners, um, so it doesn't matter which one you use to be able to, to send it to them. Um, they can accept them all. And uh, there's a whole, I do a whole other lecture on why digital scanners are so amazing and all the things they can do. And, and only one of them is take the impression. There's so many other fantastic things they can do besides taking the impression that make them worth getting. Because like I said before, polyvinyl and polyether still work. But if you really want to unlock, you know, the power of digital dentistry, it's with a scanner. And yeah, taking the impression is great. But it just, for if you're willing to, it's the fastest way to become a better dentist clinically is getting a digital scanner. There's just no better way. I've just seen it in my own career and that of others. When you can start scanning your preps and blowing them up on the screen and really seeing what's going on, it's a life changer or at least a career changer in terms of helping you get better if you want to get better. If you don't want to get better, then a digital scanner may not be for you. Uh, 38 Smiles, Cindy also does live assistance while scanning. This is unbelievable. You can do this with desktop sharing software with your scanner or even just FaceTime. Do it that way and be looking at the screen, at the scan together, you know, before um, the patient leaves and they're still anesthetized in the chair in case you need to make some modifications on the prep. You can even take FaceTime and show the patient's smile or the preps in the patient's mouth that way with FaceTime as well. Anything works. So go to 3daycrowns.com. I want you to experience what it feels like to get crowns back this quickly. Again, they're posterior single unit crowns that we're talking about. But I want you to be able to try and see it and be able to get some confidence so that when you talk to your lab, you can tell them, I've tried this, it works. This isn't a, a dumb marketing thing. This is the right thing to do. It just makes the whole process easier and things work better. So here is um, Cindy actually looking at an impression with the doctor. And um, she's looking at these three preps. Nice looking preps, you know, good control. I mean, that's, uh, we see so many over tapered preps that those almost look, uh, undercut, but they're not. But she is taking a picture of the first molar to show the doctor that there's not enough reduction there. And so we do have enough reduction on the two bicuspids, but Cindy does not have enough there. So the doctor's looking at uh, the screen as they have this face, as they have this call, and Cindy just sent him a picture of the screen for where it is. Patient's still in the chair, still anesthetized. Uh, the doctor's going to go back, maybe with a football burr, for example, and go back and reduce that occlusion a little bit more. It could be anterior preparations where you're doing um, the same thing and you want to just make sure you've reduced enough. This is just a model that 38 Smiles um, made for me upon my request. There's three crowns on here. I think they charged me for two crowns. So it was a pretty good deal. And we use this for patient demonstration. So tooth number three has a, again, I, it's a class five ceramic or a three Y or 100% tetragonal zirconia, full strength zirconia. 
a polished crown so we can show patients what a zirconia crown on a posterior tooth looks like. On tooth number eight, we have a class four ceramic of 5Y, so a translucent zirconia that's glazed on the facial, polished on the lingual, and then next to it on tooth number nine, what's called the class three ceramic lithium disilicate. This is IPS Emax MT, the medium translucency, glazed on the facial, polished on the lingual. So you can see um, right now we've got the translucent zirconia and the Emax next to each other. And it's, off, it's even good for dentists and dental staffs to be able to look at these sometimes, but to be able to show a patient if you wanna have a conversation with them about what you are using. So translucent zirconia is catching up to lithium disilicate in terms uh, of looks. And here I am holding it uh, up to um, uh, the window in the operatory. And you can see probably the one on the right, the crown on the right is a little more translucent at, when you can see the orange prep on the inside of it, and that is the Emax. So the Emax medium translucency, still a little more um, translucent than even translucent zirconia, but the translucent zirconia crown on the left, twice as strong as the lithium disilicate crown. So it kind of depends whether what you need there, whether it's strength or aesthetics, and really you can't go wrong with either of those choices, but it does give you something to think about and something to be able to see and demonstrate uh, for yourself. Now, another key to three-day crowns is not having to get a call from the lab saying that we need more reduction uh, on the preparation. So to streamline this process, we need to be able to give the laboratory enough reduction for what material we're using. I've got a whole other webinar that, um, that goes over this, so we're going to do it very quickly. But uh, I like to show this video to dentists because this shows why we need to step our game up when it comes to prepping. Like 20 years ago, you know, 10, 15 years ago, this didn't happen. Maybe even 10 years ago at your lab, but it's a different world now um, than it is back in the days uh, when they weren't labs weren't using um, digital design because you can see the technician click and click. See this blue circle here? This is a 2D cross section of the prep and the opposing tooth, and that's what we're seeing over here, the 2D cross section. And the technician clicked on the opposing tooth and the prep, and it says 0 0.85 millimeters. Now this is a lithium disilicate crown, so it's supposed to have, it has a minimum material thickness of one millimeter. It's supposed to be at least one millimeter thick, preferably 1.5, or at least more than one millimeter. And with two clicks of a mouse, the technician can see it's 0 0.85 millimeters. Not just 0 0.8, 0 0.85 to the hundredths place. And so the days of us eyeballing a prep and saying, oh, I think I reduced enough. And the lab going, I don't know if you reduced enough. And they're looking at the model and you go, no, I was there. I'm pretty sure I reduced enough. That he said, she said is gone. Your lab should be very willing to send you a screenshot of that to show you how much you reduced. So we have to step our game up. The lab is checking our homework now. We can no longer have a discussion. The lab's feelings 20 years ago that you know 70% of preps are under reduced in at least one spot has borne out to be true. And now they have evidence. Exhibit A, they have evidence. So let's not look like a profession who closes one eye and looks at the back at a second more and guesses how much reduction we do. Let's make sure we do accurate reduction. And that's what the reverse prep technique is all about. We're gonna use depth cuts and we wanna get a great margin because we want the lab technician to easily be able to identify it, mark it, and then build a crown right to that margin. I shouldn't be able to do preps that look this good. I've got a lousy, I got a below average set of hounds. I don't know if they're lousy. They're definitely below average. I should not be able to do preps that look good. But, and I still can't just from scratch. I still can't do ones like this where I have three plane reduction unless I use depth cuts. And again, that reverse preparation technique, there's a whole video on it, but it's using these depth cut burrs, um, six tenths of a millimeter minimum thickness for solid zirconia, one millimeter minimum thickness for um, lithium disilicate and 1.5 is great for lithium disilicate, and that's the hammer strength thickness uh, for solid zirconia like Bruxer. I don't use the two millimeter anymore because we're not doing bilayered restorations. The other thing about the technique is this 801-021C burr, which comes in a variety of sizes uh, in the new burr kit that, um, uh, that I just had made for me. I'll show you that in a second. Um, we use this round burr in different sizes, depending on how conservative we want to be with the prep, you know, whether or not we're doing lithium disilicate, solid zirconia. Maybe you still do some bilayered restorations like porcelain fused to zirconia. That's exactly where this one, the 021 works. So here's the new reverse prep kit. It replaces the old one that I designed about 15 years ago. 
This is the new one. This one reflects that we're doing much more monolithic materials, if not almost exclusively monolithic materials, by having a variety of sizes on the round burbies. That's what we prep our margin with, and we do it at the very beginning of the technique. So the two millimeter depth cutter's gone because I don't do many bilayered restorations. So there's an 018, 016, 014. Those are different sizes of the round ball. The 856025 fine diamond, that red stripe on in the front row is now there. That's how we smooth off the margins before we do the impression so that we don't have chips out of the margin when we send it to our lab. Refills are simple and affordable. And you can go to dentalcadcamshop.com. Dentalcadcamshop, all one word, dot com to check this out. Um, there's videos there. There's videos a bunch of different places showing you how to use this kit. This will give you beautiful preps because when you put the right depth cuts uh, in the right places on the tooth and just connect the dots, you end up with a beautiful prep. Um, you, if you're replacing an old crown, taking off an old crown, you have no idea how much reduction there is. You can't really use that reverse prep technique. This is my favorite and the fastest way to do it. These prep sure crown prep guides from Contact Easy. There's a one millimeter, a 1.5, and a two millimeter. I keep begging them to come out with a 0 0.6 millimeter for solid zirconia. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen, but I continue to make a lot of noise about it. There's a mesial end and a distal end, and you can just you know have the patient bite down on this and see if all their other teeth come together on the mesial end on the left, and then with the distal end, you've just flipped the handle around in your hand, and then it'll check the distal marginal ridge and the distal half of the occlusion. Then you can just pull it out to the buckle and make sure it clears those cusps. Push it to the lingual, make sure it clears those cusps. And that's how you use this to make sure you have enough reduction. It's simple, so much easier than bite registration or wax or anything else, just simple and straightforward to make sure. They used to make flexible clearance tabs, but they didn't. They weren't dead soft enough because they tried to cover the whole occlusal surface and you would get false positives. You could reduce a millimeter on a first molar with depth cutters and put the one millimeter flexible clearance tab and it would say, no, you don't have enough reduction. You did, you definitely did. It was just the design of them. They, they weren't dead soft. They wouldn't sit completely flat against the tooth. The prep requirements, we've talked about these materials. So Bruxer, the 100% tetragonal full strength, minimum occlusal reduction is 0 0.6. You have to use the depth cutter to do it. Um, but if you get some minimum material thickness and the bite is high because you didn't do a three-day crown or whatever happened, maybe the temporary fell off, um, now you have to adjust the opposing. You can't adjust this because solid zirconia will break thinner than six tenths of a millimeter. The ideal reduction for these full strength zirconias is one millimeter. 1 1.5, if you remember that sledgehammer test where I hit that crown with the sledgehammer and drove it into that piece of wood. Uh, for Emacs and other lithium disilicates, minimum occlusal reduction is one millimeter. Again, if it's at one millimeter, there should be a sticker on the case box from your lab telling you that, that it's at minimum material thickness and you have to adjust the opposing. If the bite needs to be adjusted, the ideal reduction for lithium disilicate is 1.5 millimeters. That gives you some room to play with and it gives you a nice translucent crown. If you don't like the idea of 1.5, then you can go to a zirconium material. Um, but whenever you pick a material, you have to play by the rules of that material and maintain whatever reduction you need for the minimum material thickness. So being conservative takes place in the treatment planning process. When you select what material you're going to restore the tooth with, you don't say, oh, I'm going to use Emax and then prep 0 0.8 millimeters. And when the lab says, oh, you underreduce it, you say, I was trying to be conservative. No, no, you were not using depth cutters or not using the prep sure guides to see how much you reduce and you got caught and that's embarrassing or should be embarrassing. And that's why we need to step our game up. So again, 1.5 millimeters for bi-layered crowns. Ideal thickness is two millimeters if you're still doing them. Again, whole webinars that I do out there on beautiful preps and the reverse prep technique. Impression requirements for three-day crowns. Obviously, it's got to be digital to do it in three days. Um, you can do polyvinyl, you can do polyether, but it's just going to add that day of shipping and whatever plaster room time is going to be onto it. But I don't want to ignore those because the techniques that we use to achieve good polyether and polyvinyl siloxane impressions work for digital too. My favorite quote from one of my mentors, Bill Strupp, in reality, crown and bridge impression is merely a reflection of the dentist's integrity. Nothing more and nothing less. Ouch. Say it like it is, Bill. Tell it like it is. I think a crown and bridge impression is a little too strict. I would say 10 crown and bridge impressions would show you the habits of a dentist. A single one could just be a, a patient who's almost impossible to work on. 
And again, you should see seven and 10, nice results. You know, this is what we're trying to do with our two chord technique, not stuff that looks like that indistinct. There's no way for the technique, even when it's poured up in stone, it's hard to figure out what's going on. And this one, the dentist just kept adding different colored wash materials. Every time there was a bubble, there's still a bubble, but the dentist ran out of colors. If they had a purple, I'm sure they would have relined it one more time. Uh, I use ultra pack cord from Ultranet just because I've always used it. It's a hollow braided cord and I like how it packs. So I've got a double zero in the base of the sulcus. That's that black line. And then we take the two cord out before we take the impression. And that's what gives us this lateral retraction between the margin and the tissue. This is all lab technicians want is lateral retraction. They don't care that much about vertical retraction. It's that lateral retraction that they really want where those red arrows are going from the margin over to that free margin of the gingiva. And when you squirt the material in, it just flows and it goes everywhere you want it to. Dentists are always trying to use light body material, trying to squeeze it in the sulcus, but that doesn't work. You have to physically move that tissue away. And that's why we leave that top cord in place for um, six to eight minutes after it's been in place. So when we take it out, it doesn't immediately fall back. Um, that's why we don't leave it in for one to two minutes, but we found it, we don't need to leave it in for 12 to 14 minutes, six to eight works fine which is also the ideal length of a hygiene exam. So I'll walk into my hygienist in the middle, whatever she's doing, and it's now time for the exam because the cord's in place. You know, otherwise I may not be available, so I go do it now. It's a good way to leave the cord in for six to eight minutes. And you can see the kind of results you get on impressions. Again, it's uh, amazing with the two cord technique. Some dentists say, oh, that's too much work. The first cord gets dropped into place is the second step of the reverse prep technique. That double zero cord, you just floss into place. And it, you know, the one at the end, okay, it might take you a minute or two, but in a lot of states, your assistant can do it. Your assistant's fully capable in all states. There's just some that don't think a death that I don't know. Maybe there's been more cord placement deaths than I know about, or or tissue just being ripped off from the periosteum um, from crazy dental assistants who experience spasms in their hands. But meanwhile, they can do everything on the temper. It's it's crazy. Some of the dental practice acts, but. You know, just even if you, even if you don't want to do it, you have to do something else. You can't just say, oh, I don't want to do two cord. So therefore I'm going to try no cord. No cord doesn't work. N not even on an equi gingival margin. Yes, a super gingival margin, it works. But if you use my prep technique, you're going to be slightly sub gingival. And if you're replacing an existing crown, you're probably going to be slightly sub gingival. So two cord is great. Digital impressions, like I said, if you want to do three day crowns, you want to do it. Here's a quick list of everything a digital impression unit will do. Blow up your prep to inspect your margins. You may not like what you see the first few times you do it, but you're gonna be able to get better because now you can see it and now you can fix it. You get to look at a virtual model on the screen, you know, a positive rather than a PVS, a polyvinyl siloxane abyss, where you're trying to look into the impression and like rebuild the model in your head. Our brains kind of don't work that way. They work better when we can see a margin, when we can see a prep where it's actually a positive, where it's not a negative space where we're looking into the impression. You can repair it. So unlike polyvinyl and polyether, if you have a bubble somewhere, you gotta retake that with those impressions. Not so on digital impressions, cut that area out, dry off that area, rescan it, hit it with the diode laser if you need to stop the bleeding and rescan that area, stitch it in. It allows your technicians to modify or approve the preps. If you have desktop sharing software, again, we said you could do that with a FaceTime call with the cameras being so good. Unlike an iPhone 13 now, you can do that with your technician. Allows your technician to improve your impression. If you're doing a digital scan, they can see it um, before you send it over if you want them to while the patient's still there. That's the key thing. While the patient's still there, 30 seconds later, 60 seconds later, it's in your technician's lab so they can tell you, especially on large anterior cases, multi-unit anterior cases, you always want your technician to tell you, you are done, you're finished prepping. These preps look great because otherwise you've tied like one hand behind their back and said, okay, do your best. And so this is true teamwork. This digital technology allows our technicians, doesn't have to be in front of the patient. You can scan it or just hold the scanner there and have an earpiece in or just go back to your office and pull it up on the monitor and do it there. But I take pride in it. I'm, what, what patient has ever had, whatever their, whoever their ceramic artist is gonna be looking at their teeth via FaceTime or via a scanner? and say, Cindy, who's going to be designing your restorations, wants to see this. Cindy, um, is there anything you see on the teeth that uh, I can do to help you get us a, a better, more beautiful result? Patients are blown away that we're taking this extra time. They've never seen anything like this 
um, before. And they get to hear Cindy's voice and there's just this team that's working to give them this great aesthetic result. Uh, so the big thing again, correcting it while the patient's there and still numb is it's very difficult to ask the patient, to come. it's not difficult, it's just painful to ask them to come back, re-anesthetize, take the temps off and then do something different with the prep or the impression. And then of course you can fabricate the crown in your office if you have a mill or send it to the lab, it gives you that option. And many labs give discounts for digital impressions, why? Because they don't have to do all that plaster work and then scan all and then scan those models into the digital environment. You're sending it to them in the digital environment. They should give you a discount because you're saving them a lot in materials, but more importantly in like uh, man hours of having an employee have to do all that stuff. So they should give a discount for it. The scanner that I'm in love with right now is the 5D Plus. Uh, I'm so happy that uh, I bought this one, uh, but I'm doing a lot of Invisalign as well. I'm wearing Invisalign um, as I do this. And so we, we just, I've gone, d dove in, you know, very deep into Invisalign. Pretty much I, I like doing Invisalign and no prep veneers are my two favorite things to do or minimal prep veneers, depending on the case. Um, and so the, the, the 5D plus is so great at this. It's just, there's no better scanner that I've seen to train beginners on. I mean, your front office staff can grab it. This thing's so tolerant of mistakes. You don't even, you, you can take it out of the mouth and like, be holding it while you dry off the mouth and it's scanning like the floor or the wall and it knows to ignore it and you put it back in the mouth. I, I've never seen a scanner that was so mistake tolerant that nobody feels intimidated to use it. You know, they might be slow the first couple times they use it, but honestly in our office, both our front office employees could scan somebody if they needed to. And um, you know, we have contests, there's a clock on it and we always wanna see who's the fastest. Now it's not them, they don't do enough scanning obviously, but anybody can do it. That, that doesn't, you know, it's just to prove the point of how mistake tolerant the 5D Plus is. But we still have to maintain, they aren't magic. They can't see through tissue or blood or saliva. And so you can see that we've got a digital scan where tissue is touching the preps on these two areas. This was a case that was sent to 38 Smiles Digital Dental. And um, the dentist told the lab to move forward with it. And then, you know, when, this, when it got cemented, they sent a copy of the x-ray back and said, oh, there's two open margins. Guess where it was? Right where the tissue was touching the prep. You know, that can't be acceptable um, to have that happening. And maybe with piling vinyl, you could have got away with it by shoving material in between there, but I doubt it. Um, you just have to take really good care. So you can tell two cords weren't used here because there's no lateral separation. You know what else gives you lateral separation? A diode laser. There wasn't a diode laser used there either. There's, I don't understand dentists who think you can take impressions or would want to take impressions without some sort of retraction. And, I, and, I, and well, I should rephrase that. I don't mean any sort of retraction. I mean, without two cords or a diode laser. You know, one cord sucks. That's what I was taught in school. It starts bleeding as soon as you pull it. And with one cord, you can get vertical retraction of the tissue, but you got to put that second cord in to get the lateral retraction. You have to. It doesn't matter how big the first cord is. There has to be a second cord. You have to account for the vertical retraction in order to create the lateral retraction. Or you can do it with the diode laser. But we have to be better. You can see what happens on a stone model. It looks the same way because the, uh, the second time um, the dentist took a polyvinyl impression and sent it in, and you can see it looks just as bad. It looks worse maybe on the stone model. Like here you're like, oh, can't they just kind of guess where the, the margin of the prep is? What? They shouldn't be guessing anywhere, but you can see on that stone model just how bad that looks. And here's another case, same kind of thing with some undercuts on the tooth as well. Again, anytime your technician sees this, they can alert you to it and have you change it um, before you do it. If you want to go cordless, it's, it's gonna have to be with a diode laser. You can, you can use them where tissue's not healthy enough to pack cord. You know, you have to have a little bit of health to the tissue. If you've got an area where a DO filling fell out on number 19, the patient's been packing food in there for four months, you're not gonna be able to pack cord in there. The tissue's just too edematous. You can't get underneath that gingival cuff to get a cord to stay in place, but you can use a diode laser there. It exclusively creates lateral retraction doesn't cause trauma to the gingiva as with overzealous um, cord packing. So you don't have to worry about it tearing and they cut slow enough where you can't overcut to, you could, I guess you could overcut tissue, but not in one fell swoop like you could with electric surgery where mistakes uh, could be kind of devastating. 
And you can use it around implants and amalgams and other metals. So it's very versatile, can be used anywhere. It is more expensive than packing cord, I get it. And it's difficult to use on anterior teeth for troughing due to the vertical loss of tissue, which inadvertently exposes the margin. We don't want the patient to see where the lithium disilicate or translucent crown on the anterior tooth and the, and the prep margin come together. We want that slightly hidden. And so with the diode laser, it's dicey because our, our tips are still too thick. You know, these 400 micron diode laser tips, I wish they were 100 microns thick, but nobody has figured out something they can make those out of that won't break when you try to pull it through the sulcus. But when we can do a 100 micron thick tip, then I will be doing it in the anterior again. And yes, I know that a wire uh, on an electrosurge is getting close to that, but I didn't like all the rigmarole of electrosurge and I didn't like how easily you could overcut tissue either. So I only use diode lasers on posterior teeth. I do not use them for troughing that is. I will recontour tissue all day long with a diode laser on anterior teeth, but I will only trough for crown preparations on posterior teeth with a diode laser. Um, the one I have now is the Denmat NV Pro 3. Uh, I don't know, there's so much to love about this little portable unit. If nothing else, the foot pedal that goes along with it, that's got a little housing over the top of it. I wish all, I wish my rheostat for my handpiece had that as well. So you can pick it up with your foot and move it if you're, you know, shifting positions, turning your hips and going to a different position to get a different angle while you're prepping. I love being able to lift my foot with the NV Pro 3. Uh, foot pedal and move it and set it back down and then step on it and use the laser again. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to do that for my um, rheostat for my hand pieces, how to build a housing around that to be able to, to do that. So that is my uh, current favorite laser, the one I'm using now. You initiate the tip with a Sharpie or some articulating paper. You can see the dark tip at the end of that 400 micron tip. But you can see again, you know, how thick that is. It's thicker than it needs to be, not needs to be, I guess it needs to be that thick now, but then it should be, or ideally would be. Um, but again, look at that lateral retraction and you see that kind of onion peel look that you get. That's how you can always tell that a laser has been done. That tissue will, three days later, you won't be able to tell that laser was used, but we're just temporarily clearing that margin. Look at that, look how clear it is. You can absolutely see exactly where, oops, that margin was and your technician can too, and that's really, really important. So what I was trying to do was pause it right about here. I mean, look at this margin. It's clear as a bell, and look at all that space for the impression material to go into. You get this. You get the same thing with two cord um, technique, but or you can do it with a diode laser. But you got to use one of them. You pick one. <laughs> it's not. Don't do nothing. Pick one, and then after the diode laser, we come in with our Traxident or our Exposil or our Dries Blue from Parcal is the one I'm currently using. Whatever you want to use, but these are adjuncts to diode lasers, in my opinion. These are very good at stopping bleeding or oozing after that. I use these all the time, dropping proximal boxes on uh, direct composites if I cause some bleeding. What these materials are not good at is getting lateral retraction of the tissue away from the tooth. It doesn't, they don't do that. They shouldn't be marketed that way. But they are, but it's up to us to go, you know what? I know what it looks like to have lateral retraction. These don't do it. But if you use a diode laser and you can see again, like the onion skinning around this molar, telltale signs that the diode laser was used. Then you can use the Exposil, for example. Then you can rinse it off and get a good impression. So that's when these get used. So to me, the only cordless technique that works is a diode laser. That's it. That's the only one that works unless you have a super gingival margin. But equigingival or slightly subgingival, we've got to use something to retract that tissue. Okay, that is the end of my whirlwind, whirlwind journey through uh, three-day crowns. The rationale for why we're doing them, 38 Smiles Digital Dental, 3daycrowns.com. Give them a try and see how this concept works for you. Now, it's going to be tough. I can tell you right now that your um, front desk is not going to want to schedule the patients that soon. It's going to blow their mind. And you're going to have to do a little bit of counting if you prep it on a Thursday versus if you prep it on a Monday to figure out when it's getting back. But that's why 38 Smiles uh, Digital Dental has a digital portal that you just open up on the website and you can see exactly where any of your cases are and when they've shipped. And they'll ship it overnight back to you in the interest of getting it back into the mouth as soon as possible. So through their portal, you can see where the cases are. They scan the case, all the cases in the lab five times a day. So as it progresses through, 
you can see where it is, when it's coming back. And, you know, maybe you're afraid to schedule the patient right off the bat um, that quickly until you do it for a time or two. Then, well, when the crown comes in, then call the patient and let them know you're going to be calling because this lab gets it back quickly and you don't want him them to have to live with this piece of plastic in their mouth. I promise you, this is where the industry is slowly but surely heading. I would give you the name of another lab besides 38 Smiles that does three-day crowns, but I don't know of one that does it routinely for all posterior single unit crowns. Or I would, if there was three or four, I'd be happy to list all of them for you so you could try one. The commitment's just always been there because when we were practicing together in the lab, this is what we did. And so they just, when they started their lab, this was an extension of that. So give three day crowns a try. I know you're going to see less adjustments, you know, less remakes, crowns dropping into place. Um, the crown seat appointments become f just fun and they become short. We're not having to anesthetize. We're not having to do anything else besides just kind of drop the crowns in a good 85, 90% of the time. Be ahead on this curve. Uh, be one of the ones who adopts this mentality uh, early and don't be afraid to be a little demanding with your lab and saying, I, there's another lab that I used three times. I was able to do this. Why can't you do this? We, I know it's possible. I've seen it done. And it does only take a day for lithium bisilicate and two days for zirconia. I understand that's, you know, with nothing else to do. Uh, but at 38 Smiles, that's how they do all their posterior single units. So uh, give it a try. I know you're going to like it. And uh, three-day crowns is the future. So be part of it early rather than later.